Hi, and welcome to Decoding AQ, helping you to learn the tools, mindsets, and actions to thrive in an ever-changing world. Hi, and welcome to Decoding AQ. We've got a really very special guest with us here today, Heather McGowan. Welcome. Hey there, thanks so much for having me. Great. So I'm going to give a little tiny bit of an intro, but then hand it over to the best person who can talk about themselves, and that's themselves. So from from my perspective, you've written a number of books. You've got a new one that was just out only uh, not very long ago, April 14th. Is that right? You're the Adaption Advantage. Uh, and I think that's really exciting. So we'll get to dive deep into there. But a uh, speaker internationally, future of work, and really looking at what's coming down the pike and how do we prepare humanity in order to adapt and survive, to thrive in a world that we create uh, that's hopefully one where no one's left behind, which will be a wonderful world that we can, we can do. So yeah, why don't we dive in and just give us a little bit about yourself, uh, some of the uh, highlights that you'd like to, to share, perhaps. Sure. So I, I love the way Steve Jobs once said that dots don't make any sense connecting them forward, only backwards. And I think nothing could be more true for me. Uh, my undergraduate degree is in industrial design. I worked in product design, doing everything from baby products to surgical products to tennis sneakers to working in boutique investment bank, banking for social responsible businesses, to uh, design strategy consulting and management consulting, to uh, working in higher ed for a decade. And from all of those pieces, I started realizing that the reason I had so many jobs and had so many experiences, and I started working when I was 13, I got working papers so I could have more jobs. I was just obsessed with experiencing new things. And I think now looking back on it, that I was really interested in work and how we attract people into it and how we engage people into it and how it's rapidly changing. So I spent the last 10 or 12 years working for both corporate and academic clients until about three years ago when I went out to just just speak and just write, um, helping them try to create better workforces for the world that's out there. And since then, I feel like I won the lottery because now I get to write and speak all the time about all these experiences that I've had and all these conversations like with you that I get to have. That's interesting. Tell me about that transition from uh, work and corporate. And then I think it might have been stimulated from an article you you wrote, perhaps, but that uh, kind of transition that led you to this chapter in your life of learning in terms of directing around speaking and writing and those sorts of things. So what, what happened? What triggered that for you? So it was about 2013, 2014. I started seeing all these people out there speaking, writing books about the future work. And all of them were from the standpoint that the robots were coming and we were creating a useless class of humans. And at the time I was on my third tour, I think in a university, different university, and higher ed trying to help them prepare college graduates for the workforce. And they were not doing a great job, honestly. A lot of higher ed institutions are preparing people for jobs that were you know, gone 20 years ago. And I thought, there's such a disconnect. There's a disconnect with my corporate clients who are not getting the talent that they need. There's a disconnect with my university clients who are preparing people for jobs long gone or soon to be gone. And then the only voice out there talking is talking about how, don't worry about it because technology is gonna take over everything. I am deeply optimistic about humans. I think humans are driven to create, driven to improvise, driven to innovate, if you just let them. And I think what we were doing is disengaging students. I mean, Gallup's proven that from uh, grade school to high school, our level of engagement drops dramatically. Well, what happens during that period of time? We go from what are you interested in in discovery and self-awareness to what are you good at? What'd you get on the standardized test? That's disengaging. And so I wrote my first uh, major article. It was actually a four part series called jobs are over the future is income generation. And I was really just trying to create this provocation that we need to stop preparing people for jobs that once existed and prepare them to be continuously learning and adapting and entrepreneurial. And the second part of that article went viral and 100,000 people read it in, I think, 24 hours or something like that. And I started getting speaking requests from all over the world, people saying, we've been waiting for someone to talk like this about humans. And the first one was in Australia. I spoke for uh, AMP. And then that led to, there was a video of that that went on YouTube, and that led to more speaking requests. And then 
fast forward, now I have all these agents who represent me and I speak all over the world and I write for Forbes and I have a book that just came out. And it's interesting, isn't it, about how we communicate a thought. You know, it lives in our minds first and then it comes out in some way. Hopefully it doesn't stay in there in a, in a dark corner of our minds. When we then share it, that can either repel or attract, you know, it can resonate. As you said, you wanted to propagate a, perhaps a different train of thought about humans and the future of how we engage in value creation. And you picked up a, a point there, and I've uh, listened to a number of your pieces talk about this challenge of identity and where throughout our education and some of the first questions people ask, oh, so what is it you do, you know, after a name? And the interconnection and how related those things are, our identity and our roles and work. And perhaps we're facing a, a real danger of what that represents. Do you want to just expand a little bit on some of your, some of your thoughts around identity and the challenges in adapting that for the future? Yeah, so I don't have children myself, but I'm really close to my nieces and my nephew. My two sisters both have uh, three, two kids and three kids. And so I talk to them all the time. And one day my niece, Izzy, called me up and she said, Auntie Heather, it's career day tomorrow at school. She was four at the time. I said, seriously, it's career day tomorrow? Wow. She said, yeah. yeah, and I want to be a unicorn. I said, that's fantastic. She loves unicorns. And she said, yeah. So my teacher told me it wasn't realistic. I had to pick something more realistic. So at the age of four, we're telling kids to be more realistic and pick a future self, and the world's never moved more quickly. So then I started to question, why are we asking young kids what they want to be when they grow up? I like what comedian Paula, Paula, Paula Poundstone said. She said, we're asking kids because we're just looking for ideas. <laughs> I think she's right. I like it. But, yeah. um, then we start asking, then with my work in universities, we start asking students to pick a major before they used to step foot on campus, now maybe dial into the Zoom that was campus. And that's picking a future self based upon a very thin slice of life. So in high school, they tell you what you're good at and more importantly, what you're not good at. And then you never avoid, you avoid those areas for the rest of your life. And we look around at the people around us, mostly our parents and our parents' friends, and maybe if we have some older friends, and we think those are the possibilities for us. Like for, in, in my instance, my undergraduate degree is in industrial design. I didn't know that field existed at all. By chance, I got into Rhode Island School of Design. I'm so lucky I did. It was the best experience, one of the best educational experiences of my life. And I discovered it there. But I, if I had gone somewhere else and declared a major, I might have been stuck in a dead end track. And we do this to students and we tell them not to take anything outside their major. The only real study I've seen on this was out of the Federal Reserve Bank in New York that said only 27% of people ever work in the field of their undergraduate major. Well, guess who those 27% are? Faculty who tell you not to take courses outside your major. And so we're locking people into this set of sense of identity, a job that's probably over or dramatically different than before you picked it, and then huge social mobility implications because you're only going to pick what you see around you, even though your capabilities are probably much beyond that and you haven't explored it. And then we ask each other, what do you do? And studies out of the UK and some studies in the US have found loss of a job can take twice as long to recover from than the loss of a primary relationship. And many people never fully recover. And right now in the US, we've got 26 million, and I would bet a whole bunch more, of people who just lost their jobs going through a massive identity crisis. So we address that head on in, in the book, the center chapter, the first part of it is on accelerated change, pre-virus, but same principles apply mm -hmm. just faster now. Middle part of the book is how do you deal with your identity? How do you adapt? How do you get in touch with your purpose and your passion and your curiosity and your skills? And then the third part of the book is for leaders and the, it was designed so that leaders could use it with their teams. How do you lead in this new normal? I, I find it fascinating. I don't know if you've come across a writer called Ben Hardy. Um, he was for a number of years, the number one most read uh, writer on Medium uh, on the blog oh. platform. And he's a, a doctor of... Um, organizational psychology. One of his first books was uh, called um, Willpower Doesn't Work. And his one just coming out is called Personality Isn't Permanent. And it's a very interesting uh, kind of view and take. And it's a, got a lot of similarities to this identity fixation that we have and the danger of seeing it as a fixed 
or anchored in things that are outside of our control so that when that external factor comes in and changes it, we have an internal crisis. You know, if we lose a job, for example, how we recover from that. And yeah, I think we're going to face the largest uh, unemployment rates we've ever seen, you know, even beyond the 1934 big one. And equally our personality. So is our personality part of our identity, part of our occupation and work? And where does this cross over between our identity and personality being orientated around a goal or an, around a dream or an imagination or part of purpose, right? right? Some of Simon Sinek's work of more about our why and then how we show up evolves according to the environment, according to technology, according to what it needs of how we create and execute that purpose in value creation. So I'm, I'm interested in kind of that uh, third part that you talked of in the book. So if the first part is all around just getting people confident with they're able to adapt, maybe now it's speeding up. And for some, they will have seen it, but not felt it. But maybe now everyone's feeling that because we've had this catalyst event. And then about how our identity uh, we need to unlock and uh, unshackle from that. But in terms of the leadership, tell us a little bit more about what you mean by that. Is it leadership of oneself or is a role in, in work? What's the kind of aspects uh, in those parts? Well, probably both, but um, we s explicitly speak about it in terms of how do you lead your teams. And, you know, we're coming out of what John Hagel from Deloitte calls scalable efficiency era is also the era of shareholders where everybody sort of, we started treating humans more like machines. We started treating them like dehumanized units of productivity and how much could you just squeeze out of them? And we measured everything by, you know, KPIs around productivity. Humans are really good at stirring the pot, at intent, at innovation, at improvising. We can't help ourselves. And if technology can do more and more of the efficiency stuff, Hegel says we're moving into the world of scalable learning. How does everything at work become part of a sort of learning adventure, learning tour? And I definitely buy into that. So leading a team on a learning tour is different than leading a team to maximize efficiency. Um, first, you have to establish trust. Um, Aiden, Dr. Amy Emmonson from Harvard Business School says you have to establish psychological safety. Google found that when they studied across 180 different teams over two years that the number one determinant of team success in accelerated learning is psychological safety. And what does that mean? That means you got to make an environment that's comfortable for people to say, hey, I need help, or I didn't get that, or you know what, I have a question about that because I'm not sure I agree. Cognitive diversity, also very important. Um, Dr. David Lewis and Dr. Allison Reynolds out of London Business School found that the teams that learn the fastest have a combination of psychological safety and cognitive diversity. And leading these teams, you also have to establish a sense of trust and you have to be willing to be vulnerable because if you as the leader says, hey, wait a second, you guys know something I don't know, I need to understand that better. And increasingly that's true as skills and knowledge come into the workplace and leaders are suddenly in charge of teams where people on their teams have knowledge and skills they don't have. It requires an entirely different style. Um, you know, I spoke with uh, Jim Kunz's from the Leadership Challenge extensively for the book, particularly the leadership chapter. And he said, none of these things are actually new. They're just more important. They're just more intense. He's got, you know, 30 or 40 years of study, uh, studies on leadership. And so he said, everything's just moving faster now. It's like you're on the racetrack and you were going 50 miles an hour, and now you're going 70, but so is everybody else around you. So it requires this focused attention on some of these factors in a way that's never been there before, and especially in this moment with the virus. I mean, how do you establish psychological safety? How do you inspire your teams right now when they're in unprecedented stress levels and they're, you know, they're in different locations? It becomes the leaders that are gonna emerge out of this are just gonna be the leaders of the future. I think that's a really interesting aspect in terms of, you know, in order to lead, we have to learn. In order to learn, we have to say we don't know. Yes. And therefore, we've got to be comfortable in the uncomfortable. Uh, and that, that uh, opportunity to almost provide this space and environment that a leader should, you know, encourage to happen 
is vitally important. And I uh, remember one of your quotes in terms of those who learn lead, you yeah. know, and I think it's those who learn and adapt lead, you yeah. know, in, in that sense. And another uh, piece I picked up was just the extent of learning that's going to take place at work. And you shared some stats in a, a previous piece about the percentages of our time each day that we might attribute to historically being efficient and creating value um, and therefore a focus on technical skills right. to now, a, you know, a shift to human skills, imaginary discovery, ideation, innovation, those sorts of things and learning. Can you share perhaps just a little bit more, some of those, um, those parts of what you discovered and, and what you, what you see? Yeah, so Dr. David uh, Eagleman says that our brains work in two modes. We have exploration and exploitation. So if you think about us like, you know, as animals, we, we explore to find a source of food and then we go, okay, we know the blueberries are over there and we'll exploit that source until it's depleted and then we'll explore again. Exploitation allows us to save some energy. Exploration is always, you know, a hit or miss. Works that same way in value creation. If you think of the S curve, you know, the beginning of the S curve, when you're below, you know, when it's costing you something, you're exploring, you're not sure what's going to happen. And then you ramp it up when you exploit it. Now, when products, services, business models, and entire companies lasted longer, research from InnoSight says, you know, they used to be 35 years, something like that. Now we're going towards 12 years. How long a company lasts on the S&P 500 as a proxy for how long a company exists? Business models. So suddenly you need pe more people working in exploration mode, not just in exploitation mode. Also, technology consumes more and more routine and predictable tasks. That's a lot of the stuff on the exploitation side. So we need more people comfortable with ambiguity, more people comfortable exploring. You need leaders who can feel comfortable being vulnerable. And when we talk about learning and adaptation, sometimes people confuse adaptation and flexibility. Flexibility is reaching down in your toolbox and picking a tool you've used before, probably for a job you've had before. You're sort of uh, moving between skills. Adaptability requires you to reach in the toolbox, pull out a tool that's not fully formed yet, forge it for the task at hand, create a new process. There's usually some letting go or some unlearning in that process. So adaptability requires this, this vulnerability, as does learning. And one of the other things that we get to in the, in the book, and we, this is in the first section on the change stuff, is we've all talked about the technological change. We've talked about globalization. There's something else that's happening and happening much more quickly, and that's societal and cultural change. And I have 14 dimensions of it in there. It's from racial compositions, which have been decades, if not generations in the making, uh, in developed countries, particularly in the US, going where, where white majority may not be a white minority uh, majority any longer, um, changes in religion, uh, from more atheists to a plurality of religions, changes in the family unit, changes in gender. Gender was yep. fixed in binary five or six years ago. It, they was the word of the year for Oxford and Webster last year to indicate a non-binary person, to leadership, to what's permissible in terms of sexual harassment, to uh, what populations are. The top 10 populations in the world right now, only two of them are countries, the rest are social media platforms. I think one of the one of the challenges is this multifaceted change. So yeah. we're, we're required to adapt in so many areas. I was healthy. Now I'm not healthy. I was, you know, married. Now I'm not married. You know, all of these things that happen either in our social lives or in work, I was employed. Now I'm not employed. Yeah. I had this role. Now I have this role. And right. each of these aspects we might be able to deal with in isolation. Right. It's uh, it's like torture, you know, death of a thousand cuts that what we're facing now is adaption of a thousand requirements. Um, right. and, and that's those, a very different space for us to deal with. Right. And when all those factors of societal and cultural change factors, the reason I mention them, it's not just those adaptations. It's some people feel um, they've got to freeze. They, their place in the world is not clear. They're a little uncomfortable. I gave um, so part of that, that part in a talk to uh, a group of educators in the Midwest, and this guy sat in the front row, he had his arms crossed, he was glaring at me, and I thought, oh no. And he came up to me afterwards and he said, I've been feeling that for almost a decade. I'm a white, straight Christian man in the Midwest. I don't know where I fit. I don't know how to behave anymore. 
I lost my role in a company. I'm now in another role. And it has me a little frozen. He's like, you got to keep talking about it. And I think that we all have to say, and when I, when I do it on, I do virtual keynotes as well. When I do virtual keynotes. I do polling in it. And when I get to that part, if I use it in the talk, which I usually do, uh, people are anonymous. And I get okay, almost 20% of the people who say, you know what, I, this stuff makes me feel uncomfortable. And I don't know where yeah. I fit. Now, if I was in a live audience, I wouldn't be able to get that reaction. So there's one upside of the, the virtual stuff. Of the virtual. It's interesting you, you covered about exploitation and exploration. And those are uh, particular factors that we measure in our adaptability quotient. And there is a lacking in the exploitation. And I think what we found from our research and results is that some of this comes back to the fundamental um, kind of culture and environment and particularly resilience. So they might explore once, but if you get burnt, how quickly can you bounce back to go and do it again? Right. And so all of these factors that are maybe uh, these combinations of abilities or characteristics or the environment that is created allows us to, to layer this sort of muscle to be able to face, as you talked about, ambiguity or uncertainty. So it's not about trying to predict what it's going to be and then train exactly for that moment, but be comfortable for whatever that moment has to offer. You know, you see all these big statistics about how many people have got to reskill or upskill, how many jobs don't exist. You know, 40% of the jobs we're going to have in a few years' time don't even exist yet. So how can we train for that specifically? What we need to look at is the capacity in which to uh, respond to uncertainty in a pace that um, is quick enough and with as little emotional or physical or psychological damage to get through and survive so that we're in a state of thriving. I, I'm interested in perhaps some uh, examples and stories of where you've seen uh, teams or organizations rapidly adapt um, to you know what's what's gone on i remember one thing uh recently you shared about uh just how quick with this catalyst of of coronavirus organizations of people are collaborating uh mm -hmm. perhaps the piece around uh, mit uh mm -hmm. collaborating g g share that story and maybe some other stories of where you've seen it really happen at speed and well yeah, so we're we have no maps for where we are right now. I mean, we can we can blame our government. There's lots of lots of places for blame, and we'll we'll find them. And when we do the uh, the post mortem on on this whole experience, but along the way, we're responding so quickly. A friend of mine owns a trade show company. That business has been you know decimated. She makes very large. She's the CEO of the company, the founder of the company, and she said to me, "We stopped and we said, what are we good at, and where's the need." And let's capitalize on that. And so they've figured out how to make face shields and they've figured out how to make booths for te rapid testing centers and that sort of stuff. And they rapidly pivoted with, within like a week or two. Um, the example you're talking about from MIT, a hundred different scientists got together and designed a face shield that could be rapidly produced for $3 when the industry average is $5 and they did it in something like 10 days. And now they've got a manufacturing center in Massachusetts is doing 100,000 of them a day. Um, I can't remember if it was Ford or GM, it's probably both of them. I heard the other day on the news, they haven't made a car in like a month, but they quickly in two weeks wrapped up to make, ramped up to make ventilators. Um, distilleries making hand sanitizer, perfumeries making hand sanitizer, fashion houses making PPE. I mean, all over the place, people are sort of figuring out what is it we're good at? Where does the need? How quickly can we ramp up? And humans need a sense of purpose. Like we don't want just universal basic income without any obligations. We may need that as a safety net, but people want to feel a part of something. And I think those stories are tremendously empowering to the people who are doing that work. And then also to the rest of us who appreciate the speed in which people are pivoting and collaborating. I'm interested in your thoughts around the difference when um, it's on fire, you know, when we have a burning platform, humans can respond to that, right? So we have this crisis, we have this call, and suddenly people are able to go, I'm going to pivot, I'm going to adapt, I'm going to, you know, look where the need is, see what we're good at, and create something that we haven't done before. It's that horizon three innovation, you know, it's often the harder stuff to do. And I think what... Uh, you know, without this catalyst of, of coronavirus, the sort of sneaky 
uh, things that were providing just enough value. You know, it might've been a product, a service or a process that was okay. And we haven't had the stimulus to unlearn that, to say, this is not good enough anymore. And that to be an intentional, proactive choice to desire a betterment rather than being disrupted by somebody else. How might without, um, you know, or maybe post this uh, catalyst, how could we maintain that sense of discovery, of um, thinking what might be possible rather than just to, ah, we've got something, let's exploit it as long as we can uh, to continually keep that pace of innovation and collaboration. How, How might we... How might we do that well? What would be your advice to that, even if you think that's a good thing? <laughs> well, um, I think that, I don't know that we could recreate the pressure we have right now, nor, nor should we. It's probably not good for humans long term, but it's encouraging how we've responded. Um, my friend Peter Sheehan says, don't create a burning platform, create a burning ambition. And the focus, in, and a lot of that I think comes from when we start talking to Izzy when she's four years old to when we start talking to university students and high school students and we start tracking talent, instead of telling people what they're good and not, be- and not good at, that just pushes you into an exploitation role. If you light the fire in people, you help them understand or help them understand for themselves what they're curious about, what they're purposeful about, what they're passionate about, and you align that with a company culture, you can go on these sort of unending learning tours we probably won't get the pace of innovation that we're gonna get right now, but we'll continue a pretty high pace. And the other thing is to remind people is that we're a highly adaptive species. Look what we've done. We live in environments that were previously uninhabitable. We've made them habitable. In the last 70 years, we've got 5,000 years of recorded history. In the last 70 years, we've taken more people out of global extreme poverty, lifted more people into literacy, and connected half the world now to the internet in like 25 years. We've done more to improve the human condition in this last 70 years than we did in all of the 5,000 years before that. If we can do that, this virus is no match for us. I'm confident of it. But we continue to keep the pace if we have the right leaders. Like I think right now we're standing in front of a raging river. And all people can see, because all they're hearing in the media, is the swirling eddies that are going to capture them, the death toll etc. Instead of looking up across the river and seeing what's on the other side, seeing the rocks that are going to help us get across and realize that we've already started going across. You know, we have flattened the curve in so many places. We've collaborated, scientific breakthroughs that are going to come out of this. There's a lot. Of, so we need leadership that can help people understand, okay, we may have 60 more days of this, we have 90 more days, and we have three more months of this, but look up what we've done and let's look at the other side. We are improving the planet right now. This is the third existential crisis of our lifetime, the planet income inequality now this pandemic. And in this pandemic, we're pausing things and how we decide to restart the economy could be more inclusive, could be better for the planet and could unleash a tremendous amount of human potential. I think that's a really, you know, almost this gift we've been given to redesign what's next. So we've had a pause, uh, you know, neither of us want to downplay the reality of this is affecting people in a very bad way. Right. Um, But that shouldn't be at the forsake for designing a better future for those that are left. And there's going to be loads of people that are facing something so profoundly different to everything they had before from their identity to the business they worked for, to the role they even had. And whilst there's a bank on the other side of that river, I think the reality of living in an exponential world is there's many rivers. The one at the moment happens to be this, uh, you know, uh, crisis, but then there's also technological river that's coming along that will disrupt our sense of um, what is static and what is in motion. And so being good swimmers to navigate that, you know, having resilience, building these things of, uh, like you said, that I loved that term of, you know, a light of fire of ambition versus a burning platform. And it made me think of something we look at, which is motivation style in relation to adaption. So this is, do you play to win or play not to lose? So whilst the change exists, how are you communicating that change to an individual to rally a response? Is a response saying, oh, there's a fire. Oh, great. That's a nice ambition. I'll go over there and, you know, uh, have some schmores on it. Or there's a fire over there. We need to run in the other direction. Still a fire. 
But the communication to get somebody to move either towards or away from, I think is really, uh, really powerful that we can look at to get the outcomes that we're wanting. In terms of these uh, learning loops and multiple engagements and almost portfolio careers that we will be creating in the future um, by the design of uh, job tenure periods of not just your own choice, but the industry shifting so quickly. What are perhaps some of the tips maybe people or teams um, could start looking at and adopting to build that lifelong learning and the learning culture what's shifting, what's changing, what's existing, and how might they make sure they're not left behind? Yeah, so I wrote an article and I threw out a provocation and I gave a talk in Paris that learning is the new pension. So we've focused on sort of like, how much money am I making? What's my bonus? What am I putting away for retirement? All good stuff. But we need to start thinking about learning in the same way. So I tell young people when they're looking for their first job, I tell anyone looking for a job, Pick a boss, not the job. The job's going to change. Pick a culture and a boss because that person is going to be your mentor that's going to help you until another one comes along. And look to be a mentor. Um, leaders forming teams, stop filling them with people just like you. There are enough people just like you. Start filling them with people who question you. And not in a, um, not in a negative way or disruptive way. The person gives you that... that um, that essential criticism that makes you see a blind spot you didn't see before is going to be a really valuable member of your team. So looking for that cognitive diversity when you're hiring, when you're filling your company, you want cultural alignment, but you also want culture addition. So somebody's always sort of checking that. And then come from a capacity standpoint, be looking for people not who have the skills of the last job you needed, which is how we do it, but the people who are looking to constantly add and shed skills like we add and delete applications on their phone. So if we start focusing on not what did I do in my job today or what did I earn today, but what did I learn today and how am I going to think about it differently? So you start thinking like, I say your job's moving. If you're not moving with it, it's moving away from you. So doing a constant reskill and upskill assessment and working on it every day, working on your team. So we're constantly focused on culture and capacity, adding to nurturing your culture, increasing your capacity. Because then one of the examples I use in some of my talks is, Netflix, 1997, they shipped DVDs by mail. If they focused solely on the capacity for that, they would have got stuck in a, in a um, supply chain situation, which became irrelevant by about 2011, 2012, when they switched to streaming. And then 2000, um, th I'm sorry, 2007, they switched to streaming. 2011, they started doing original content. As of 2019, that was 44% of their revenues. That's three pretty big pivots in under 30 years. So maybe you're with the company the whole time, or maybe you have learning journeys that allow you to have that many experiences to pivot across business models. Because gone are the days where you can just simply say, oh, this is my job. I have no idea how my company makes money. How your company, you have to understand your company's business model. You have to understand your own business model. You have to understand their value creation and how you connect to that value creation because when their method of value creation changes, either by the market or technology replacing some of the tasks you do, you have to pivot, you have to upskill, you have to reskill. So you either become a continuous part of that company or you pivot to somewhere else. I, I, I uh, really like that story. And I think uh, one of my coaches and mentors is Dan Sullivan, a strategic coach. And a lot of um, his work is all around getting us to think about our thinking as entrepreneurs. And there's a couple of pieces. One is, you know, we've fallen in love with the problem, not with the solution, the how. So if you take Netflix, you know, I'm not really sure what their purpose is in the detail of how they might articulate it. But for me, it's to entertain audiences. And so their how was through shipping DVDs, then yeah. their how was streaming, and now their how is through original content. They're still looking to delight and entertain an audience. And so uh, what we might have grit for, you know, the passion and perseverance over the long term might be more connected to our purpose, our why, uh, and those kinds of things. But where we might have mental flexibility and experimentation and the resilience to keep going is much more in the how, how that value shows up. And that itself will stimulate us to do new things that we need a 
need the commitment, need the courage to build those new capabilities of, of that continual learning. And I, I radically believe that the largest organization uh, in perhaps the next decade doesn't currently exist. And what it might be is an education business. Um, and, you know, if we can imagine the, the titans of today, of our Googles, of our Apple, of now something X, Y, Z that has enabled us to educate on a continual basis that's as personalized in the learning style, curriculum, all of these sorts of things that is hard to scale at the moment uh, of those types of material. So I'm excited uh, about that. In terms of uh, the book itself, what was your motivation for writing it? Uh, you'd written one uh, before, you know, a book about disruption and uh, innovation. So what was the sort of stimulus behind writing this particular one about adaptability and uh, what's going on right now? Um, I had ideas about writing a book in about 2014, and it, mostly it was around the response to the articles that there was a need for that to get out there. But then um, I put it aside for a bit and I did wrote some articles and I did talks and after every single one of my talks, I do about a hundred a year, I'm sorry, 50 a year, I did hundred last years. The end of one of my talks, people come up to me and they're like, I just wish I could record that and play it again. Do you have it written down somewhere? Cause you know, I give a lot of information at once and people are like, and so I, they wanted to adjust it in a different way. And so um, my co-author and I, Chris Shipley met at that first talk I did in Australia. And so we talked about it for about four years. And we got it down to what needs to be in there? How do we tell the story? What are the important elements? Who is this for? How are they going to use it? So we thought about it very much with the audience members in mind, what they were asking for. And so it becomes, it's sort of, it's a very conversational book. It's very easy to read. I think a high school student could read it. Um, it's got 78 graphics in it. So it's easy, you know, to flip through it's color graphics in there and stuff. So it's a very simple kind of approachable thing that can, I think, help everybody in some form or fashion. Somebody could get something out of it. And it's, it's like 25 bucks or something like that. So it's easier, 24 bucks. So it's, it's affordable too. I just wanted it to be approachable, affordable, and impactful. I love it. And you, I'm not sure if this is in the book, but it's certainly in a lot of your talks about the skills we require for the future. So as opposed to thinking about uh, a particular job, and we train for that job and we need these sets of skills uh, and that there's been a big shift in the last five years, 10 years of the types of skills we need. So rather than maybe that IBM study or all the different studies, what do you see as the, the skills we need to thrive in this pace of change in an exponential world um you said you don't have children but if you did or if uh, you know you were advising uh, and working uh, with it was it your niece who wanted to be a unicorn and she's four you know what are the skills that we should be focusing on um perhaps within youth and then also as a secondary part to the question for those who are finding themselves in a crisis situation of loss of identity, loss of job. We're at 26 million. We're going to be increasing that. So let's start at the beginning, get it right for future generations. What are the skills we need to train our children and our um, younger generation? And then is that different or is it the same for those that are facing a chapter in their life that uh, they haven't faced before? Okay, for, for kids today, I think, and for all of us, I think this goes for all of us, we do need digital skills. You need to understand how technology works. You understand what is codable or computable. Doesn't mean everybody needs to code. It's different. Understanding what can be coded helps you understand where humans play best. Um, so that, that digital literacy needs to be there, but I think we've mistaken it and just lunged at digital skills. Like if you just learned this or you just learned that, you're gonna be robot proof. Um, but probably more important than that is we have to connect to what is it you're interested in? What's your why? What's your purpose? What's your curiosity? Because we do have to, you're going to have to learn on adapt for life. And we need to figure out how to connect to that internal motivation, that internal fuel source. And then a constant exploration of whatever your superpowers are. So I do have two nieces who are in university right now. They're going into their senior year, both of them. Um, they have so many messages to them. 
pick a good major. Don't take anything outside your major. You can't, you know, this is who you are, even though they were in early stages of it. I'm like, what are you guys really interested in? One of them switched majors, really good switch for her, much more natively interested in what she's doing now. The other one is in uh, a field of science. They were trying to funnel her into a very specific job, like get this degree because you'll get this job, but it wasn't general enough. So she didn't like that job. She'd be stuck in it. So I encourage her to get a, a more general degree. She'll probably get a graduate degree as well. So for university students and for K-12 students, it's getting connected to what you're interested in, constantly scanning the horizon, adding to your skills based on your internal drive. You will find your way. <laughs> if I found my way, you'll find your way. You'll find your way. I mean, you're just going to have a lot of experiences. Your first job will probably not be your last job. So take it for the learning journey that is. Take it for what you're getting out of it. Think about what you're learning. Pay attention to what you like and don't like so you can job sculpt your next opportunity or engagement or whatever me. For the people out there who have been laid off, give yourself a break, first of all. It's a really hard thing to go through. I've lost my job before. I'm lucky it happened to me when I was young and I could make sense of it. Um, I have friends who have lost their jobs, some of them after 25 years in a company, and they just got a Zoom call and said, sorry, it's over. Those folks are dealing with massive identity crisis. You know, give yourself the space to grieve. You just lost something. You just lost part of who you are. And when you're ready, start thinking about what you're interested in. Stay connected to your network. Reach out to people. There are lots of people on LinkedIn who can share information and share articles. Stay relevant, stay engaged, stay active. You will find your way back. I promise you, you will be okay. This is really, really hard and it hurts like hell, I know it. But you're gonna be okay. I, I like that you know, sense of, you know, everything's changed, but nothing's changed in terms of you know, being curious, crafting yeah. what we want. You know, some people I talk to, you know, they knew what their interest was early on and others are still on that discovery and it's yeah. okay. You know, go and do things for the first time and see, do they stick? Do you want to do them again? Do they give you energy? Um, you know, is yeah. it creating value and allow ourselves to go and discover that and think of it as, chapters in a book <laughs> you know in in that kind of sense and so for for many that loss say goodbye to it you know have some grief of that role of that job and thank it yep. you know the, the 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 sense of gratitude to be able to say i'm grateful that i had that now i have an opportunity to do something else that will take time it'll yep. definitely take time as a as a final kind of um questions and insights uh, from you. So you do 50 talks a year, you're writing books, you're uh, thinking about new concepts, new visual articulations of things. So taking thoughts, putting them into icebergs, doing all these sorts of things to help um, information become accessible. If we were to have a conversation in a year's time, what would have happened for you, for you to say, that was the best year yet for me? What are some of the sort of key uh, aspects to your year ahead that you would think that was a great year? Is it more speaking, more of the same? Is it new things? Is it you want to go bungee jumping? What is it in your world of the next year that you think that would make me in a year's time, if we were having a conversation, it was a wicked good year? What would that look like? Well, since we're in the middle of a, a global pandemic and my live speaking has paused, Mm -hmm. I'm going through my own adaptation. So how do I become good at virtual talks? Or is there another means of expression I don't even know about yet? I want to have an impact. I want, I feel like I have a message of hope that can rally humans to be more than they've been in the past by their own drive, by their own self-expression. I'd like to see more of that happening by some metric. Um, I do hope we can be face to face and you and I can, I don't know that we'll ever shake hands again, but be in the same space and have yeah. a coffee or a beer or whatever. Um, I hope we can, we can do that and we get on the other side of this with a, a better world in front of us. But for me, I've got, I've got an uphill battle of adaptation just like everybody else. Yep. Uh, if we can't meet in 5,000 people in a room for me to do a talk, 
what am I going to do? I'm doing for some virtual stuff now. I'm yep. doing a virtual book club. I'm doing some other things like that. Maybe there's another medium I haven't gotten onto yet that I need to learn. So for know. you, you've either maintained or increased your level of impact and engagement with humans, but found new ways of doing that. And learned along the way and probably failed multiple times, but important failures through learning is what it's called. Failure through learning. Failure learning. I don't know if you've uh, come across uh, Barry O'Reilly, who wrote the book Unlearning, um, but he was on uh, one of our previous podcasts. And it is that, um, you know, saying I don't know, to be able to get a breakthrough, to learn something new. And you, you touched on one of my most uh, favorite words there in terms of hope. Um, that's a fundamental baseline uh, is to cultivate and protect our hope. Uh, yep. collectively uh, as people i want to say thank you it's been a real pleasure to uh, have this conversation with you share your amazing insights and visions and views for the future and how we might create one better together so thank you very much heather thanks so much for having me it's my pleasure thank you for listening to this episode of decoding aq please make sure you subscribe on your favorite podcast directory and we'd love to hear your feedback Please do leave a review and be sure to tune in next time for more insights from our amazing guests.